should be too. If you have your Bibles, I would like for you to turn to Luke chapter 7. That's where we're going to be. And as you're turning there, if you are visiting with us, we would love to connect with you. There's a connection card on the chair in front of you. And if you'll fill that out and take it to our Welcome Center, we have a gift gift card, (laughs) not a gift fart, but a gift card for you that we would love for you to fill out and um, and, and, uh, we'd be able to bless you. As our way of saying thanks for being being with us this morning. Well, have you ever shattered something valuable before? broke something that was really, really valuable and important. Uh, One of the stories that sticks out in my mind is when Angel and I, we were in North Carolina uh, on vacation, and we are huge Christmas fans. Love Christmas. I like to get Christmas stuff all the time, okay? And I never get sick of it. We watch Christmas movies year-round, and we play Christmas music year-round. And I am not ashamed at all to say that. I don't care. Judge me. Uh, The Bible says judge not, lest you be judged, okay? Right? (laughs) Favorite verse. But anyway, so... We love Christmas stuff, so here we are in North Carolina, and we typically get a family member every year. We try to get a new, old-world Christmas ornament for each person in our family. It's kind of like something that we do. We love to do that. And so we're walking through the store. We're picking out different um, bulbs for people, and they're very, very you know, valuable, but they're also they're, they're not shatterproof. Let's just put it like that. So here is Angel. She finds a perfect <laughs> Christmas ornament for a member of our family, and she picks it up, and she fudges it with her fingers, and it it falls on the ground, and it shatters. So what do we do? All right, Angel's like, just put it back on the shelf. I'm like, no, that's the wrong thing to do. I'm just kidding. She did not do that. My wife is a very honest person over and above, like to an extreme. And so she's, she's a really good individual. But she, obviously, she took it, and she went up. She's like, look, I'm sorry that I broke it, and we'll just pay for it. And you know what the person said? Don't worry about it. It's on us. So here we were the person responsible for breaking something, and yet the owner of the store said, look, don't worry about it, and we checked out with our other stuff. That was awesome, being forgiven, you know, being debt-free on something that you did owe. And here's the deal. There are a lot of people in our lives, in our communities, even ourselves, and they're shattered. They're broken. And it's often because of their own decisions. A lot of the reason why we hurt in our lives is because of us and the stupid decisions that we make. But other times, there are circumstances that we can't control. And so what we want to do is we want to look, how does God treat people who are broken, whose lives seem shattered, whose hearts seem shattered? How does God treat a person like that? Is God for someone like that? And the answer this morning that we're going to look at is yes. God is for the person who is shattered. In Luke chapter 7, we come upon a scene where Jesus has begun his ministry, and he is doing things that other people haven't done yet. Um, In many, many years, thousands of years, he's a prophet, he's functioning as a priest, and he's showing people that he's not just the king of Judea, he's the king of the world. And so he has begun this incredible healing ministry that is showing himself to be the one that God had promised to come. He is changing people's lives. Earlier on in Luke chapter 7, Jesus healed a soldier's son. And this son um, was, was going to die. And so Jesus, on the way to heal him, the, the soldiers sent some people that represented him and said, look, Jesus, I believe so much in you that you don't even have to come to my house. All you have to do is say the word, and my child will be healed. My child will not die. And Jesus said this, I have not seen as much faith in all of the land of Judea, and all of Israel. This guy had an incredible amount of faith. And so if you can imagine, I mean, think about this. If somebody were in our community healing people this way, how would you respond? Well, it probably would be tweeted on Twitter and posted on Facebook, and the news would spread, and people would begin to go see this person who's doing things that other people can't do. And that's exactly what's happening to Jesus. He is in a triumphant, um, exciting ministry. He has just healed this guy's uh, son, and he's done a lot of other stuff too. And so momentum is beginning to build for Jesus' ministry. And so he enters this town called Nain. He's, he's approaching this town, and Nain is the only time mentioned in the Bible. And it's, it's just south of his hometown of Nazareth. And here is Jesus, this crowd of people, this momentum ministry, and two crowds come to meet together. Because on their way into the city, there's another crowd, a crowd of broken people. There is a widow who lost her only son, and her life is shattered, and it's broken. Let's read along together starting in verse 11. It says that his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. And so they're following Jesus. I think the bottom line is simply this, that people are interested in what Jesus has to say because people continue to see how Jesus behaves. 
And I think that same principle can apply to us. If we are going to be a church that heals the brokenhearted, which we are called to be, people aren't going to listen to what we have to say until they see how we behave, whether or not it lines up with what we read about in the Bible. And so we have these two crowds colliding together. And look what Luke talks about in verse 12. He says, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Now, the interesting thing about a widow is this, is your life was basically over. Your life was over. If you didn't have a husband and you didn't have a son, you didn't have a way to bring income for yourself. I mean, there's, a, there's another Old Testament passage about this. It's in the book of Ruth with Naomi. I mean, Naomi has lost everything. And so her daughter-in-law basically has this ministry of love and compassion and says, Naomi, look, where you go, I go. Where you live, I live. Your people are going to be my people. And it's this incredible story. If you go read the book of Ruth, it's really, um, really quite uh, amazing. But anyways, we find this sacred truth in the Bible that in this Old Testament time, people who didn't have a husband and didn't have a son didn't have a life to live. She has nothing. She is so broken. She not only lost her only son, but now she's going to lose her, lose her livelihood. Put yourself in that position. Think about what it would feel like. That's what we call empathy. Sympathy is when you're able to say, man, I feel sorry for you. Empathy is when you're able to put yourself in the person's position and feel what they feel. And so I want you to do that this morning. Picture losing everything. How would you feel? Now, here we have this burial procession, and it's making its way through town. It's on its way out the gates because that's typically where they buried people outside of the town. And this son has probably died within the last 24 hours. People of this kind of livelihood who really didn't have that much money, they weren't able to preserve the body quite as long. And so they had to bury somebody quite quickly in order to prevent the smell and the decay and get them in the ground. And so this woman has just lost her son probably within the last 24 hours. And we could say that life has really been cruel to this woman. Luke does tell us she not only lost her son, but she was also a widow. And so at this point, she's entered the stages of grief. She's probably entered denial and anger, um, and she's probably bargaining with God. How could God possibly, possibly do this to her? And I think we all feel that same way when we have things that don't go well for us. I have lost people that I deeply love, close family members, and it really hurts and I understand where she's at probably in this, this grieving process. But even think about yourself. When things are going well, how do you feel? Man, God's got my back. God is for me. Things are going well. The Lord is really blessing me. But the moment something turns wrong, you think, God, why are you punishing me? Why do you hate me? Are you really for me? And that's exactly where this woman is at. And I've been there too. I can remember losing father, uncle, grandparents. You enter this bargaining phase where you really do believe, God, you've got the power and the ability to bring them back from the dead. Why wouldn't you do this to heal my hurt? And that's exactly where this woman is. And look what happens in verse 13. It says, when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. Went out to her is the Greek word spalagna. I like that word. It sounds like spaghetti, but it's spalagna. It literally means to have your inside bowels twisted and turned, to be sick to your stomach. I mean, he is grieving, not to the point where he's like, man, man, I really feel bad for that person. You know, it looks like they're going through a tough situation where Jesus has empathized with this person and he's experiencing her sorrow and her grief. It reminds me of the famous Isaiah 53 passage where it talks about how Jesus will bear the punishment and the iniquity of our sins. But in verse 3 and 4, it doesn't, go, it doesn't just limit itself to Jesus dying on the cross. It says he carries our sorrows and our griefs. He carries our sorrows and our griefs that somehow supernaturally, through the ministry and the life of Jesus, he was able not just to pay the penalty for our sins on the cross, but he was able to experience the very life things that we experience as if he was walking in our very shoes. And that's exactly what Jesus feels here. This deep, gut-wrenching, painful, emotional loss. Not just sympathy, but empathy. And Jesus was known for this kind of ministry. I mean, let me read you this passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 9, where Matthew talks about how Jesus, he says, he was going through all the towns and the villages, and he was teaching in their synagogues, and he was proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God, and he was healing every disease and sickness. And then look at this. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and they were helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. And so here's Jesus looking at people and not just healing them for the sake of fun or that it could build a powerful ministry, but he's feeling what people feel and he's excelling the kingdom of God. 
Man, I wish we could have a kind of ministry like that to where we do things not for the sake of social justice, but we do things because we see where people are and we want to bring the healing of God to their lives. We want to heal the broken hearts that we see, not only in the lives around us, but in the lives of our community. And look what he says in verse 13. He walks up to her and notice what he says, don't cry. Now, sometimes as a parent and your kids whining and crying, what do you do? My mom used to say this, if you keep on crying, I'm going to give you something to cry about, right? Right? That's not how, and that's sometimes how we view God, that here we are, broken, shattered, or people are broken and shattered in the lives around us, and we're like, suck it up, buttercup, I felt worse. And let me tell you something, as somebody who has felt pain in my life, I have a tendency to be a little callous toward the situation and circumstances of the people around me. I can be. When I see people's hurt, I can say, man, you you don't even know what hurt feels like. We have that tendency. Because we like to be the ones who says, look, I'm the one who's really hurt. But that's not what Jesus does here. He looks at this woman and he sees her pain. Maybe Jesus knew her pain because we don't see much about Jesus' father Joseph in the Bible. All we know is that he's absent from the scene. And maybe he did pass away early and Jesus felt what it was like to lose a loved one. But here is Jesus. He walks up to her and he says, don't cry. And he doesn't say just don't cry for the sake of sucking it up. That's not what he's saying. He is going to back up, don't cry, with something very, very powerful. And so like the widow's son at the funeral, God sees our shattered hearts. Like the widow, he sees our shattered hearts and he wants to heal our brokenness. And that's what the promised Messiah was going to bring. See, Jesus reflected the heart of God because he was God in the flesh. And when God sees our shattered lives and he sees our broken heart, his heart, metaphorically speaking, goes out to us. I like Psalms 56, 8, where the psalmist writer said, You keep track of all of my sorrows. You have collected all of my tears in a bottle. You've recorded each one in your book. Very powerful poetic element to how God cares for us. Look what Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 7. He talks to Christians. He says, Christians, cast your anxiety upon the Lord, for God cares for you. God cares for us, just like the widow who is suffering because she's lost her husband and her only son. God is not ignorant to our hurt. Another thing I think about with this passage is this. Like Jesus who had compassion on the shattered, we can comfort those who are shattered. He walks up to this woman. He sees her need, and he says, don't cry. Look at what the Bible has to say about how we are to have a ministry, a pastoral ministry of care. Romans chapter 12, verse 15, mourn with those who mourn. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, have compassion on one another. Look what John says in 1 John 3, 17, if anyone has material possession and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? This, this phrase, but has no pity on them, it literally means, but closes their heart up to them. You see, I think that we all feel certain things, and a lot of these feelings that we have are instinct. We see somebody in need, and our heart goes out to them. But have you ever found yourself in the situation of shutting your heart up to people who are in need, and you refuse to have compassion on them? You start thinking in your mind, you justify why you shouldn't help them, even though you felt that feeling of compassion and that conviction. Well, they put themselves in this situation in the first place. They can go out and get government assistance if they need help. And we rationalize why we should shut our hearts up to the people around us, but yet John is very clear, the love of God isn't in you if you shut your heart up to people who are in need. And specifically, he talks about material possessions. Let me share with you another scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Paul writes this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And notice what kind of father we have. The Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles. Why? Why has God comforted this woman? Why does God comfort you in your times of trouble? so that you can have a ministry of comfort to the people around you. Look at what he says. So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Man, there is something powerful about talking to a person who says, look, I've been there. I know how you feel. I know what you're going through. I've had these same struggles. I've had these same marriage issues. I've lost a parent as well. I know what it feels like to suffer. To be able to empathize and feel for the other person and where they're at is one of the most powerful things that you can do, and it puts you right in line with the character of God. 
You are acting on God's behalf when you have a ministry of compassion. That's one of the reasons why I'm so thankful for Clyde. Last week, Clyde's another minister on staff here, and Clyde oversees one of our pastoral ministries, and it's a care ministry. And Clyde has a great care for people. When people have lost people that they love, you know who the first person they call at this church? It's Clyde. When people are suffering, one of the first people that they call at this church is Clyde, because Clyde has a ministry of compassion for people. He loves people, and I am so thankful for him. And on Wednesday nights, he is teaching a Bible study um, in a group ministry about pastoral care, and we are raising up people in our church who are concerned about loving and caring for people. And we are so glad that we have people like Clyde and the people in this class who want to have a caring ministry of compassion. And that fits in with who we are as a family church. We want to be a family church where people matter, and that starts with caring for people. And so when Jesus felt something— he did something, and we should too. Look what, look what Luke goes on to say in verse 14. Look at, the, look at the risk that Jesus takes here in ministry. It says, then he went up. He tells her, don't cry. And he went up, and he touched the fire and car- that they were carrying him on. And the bearers stood still. This was a legal no-no. You do not touch a dead body. You'd have to go through all of these rituals because you'd be declared unclean, especially if you were a priest. It would ruin your ministry. Okay? You did not touch a dead body. That was a Judaic rule that was steadfast. And yet here is Jesus willing to risk it all for the sake of bringing comfort and healing. But he was willing to do that. Why? Because God was on his side. And I want you to think for a moment in your life areas that you could risk it all to genuinely care for people. Risk your reputation. Risk what people say about you. Risk your finances. Risk your security in life. If we are not willing to make a risk to care for people, we probably aren't caring for people. We have to say no to ourselves and yes to the compassion of God. And that's what we find Jesus doing. Here's this coffin with this dead body on it, this crowd of people who's going to go around and say, did you see Jesus touch that dead body? Don't stay away from him because then we got to go through the ritual of being unclean, right? It would be awful. It's like a seven to eight day ritual. And so he walks up and look what Jesus does. He does something really, really weird. He speaks to a dead body. You ever spoke to a dead body before? I have. <laughs> okay, when dad died, of course, we would talk to him, and he's, 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 he's dead. He's not there. But, uh, but, um, but have, I mean, that would be really weird. And so Jesus walks up to this boy who's laying on this, this coffin, and look what he says in verse 14. Young man, I say to you, get up. Here's this life that's shattered, and yet a very powerful principle is true. Jesus can bring something from nothing. Jesus can raise the dead back to life. Think about that for a moment. You serve someone who can bring the dead back to life. You ever feel like your marriage is dead, or your faith is dead, or your career is dead, or your zealousness for God is dead, or your love for your family is dead? Do you ever feel like that you are just, like we talked about last week, sitting on a rocking chair, making motion, but you're not going anywhere? Well, we serve somebody who can bring the dead back to life. And that's what he illustrates here in this passage, is that I am not just a good prophet. I'm the God of the universe who can bring something from nothing. And that's who Jesus is. In verse 15, he says, the dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. And so I think about, I think about this woman. She's lost her son in the last 24 hours. Her life is totally turned upside down. She has all these emotions going through her mind. She's trying to think about how am I going to make a, a, a life for myself. I'm going to be unwanted. Typically, if you were a widow, especially at this point in your life, good luck getting remarried. Good luck having an income in any way, shape, or form. And so she's got this stress of what's going to happen in life with this emotional loss, and she's probably totally broken and shattered. And then she sees this mass group of people walk up to the city gate where she just wants to get out and bury her son and mourn. And this guy named Jesus stops the crowd. He walks up. He touches the coffin. And I imagine this woman at this moment has reached breaking point. And so as many mothers as you could probably empathize, she's probably on the ground and can't even look up to what's happening. Why is this guy touching my son, right? And yet the moment that Jesus brings this guy back to life, she's probably so overcome with emotion, she can't even bear to say thank you or run to her son. And so Jesus takes the son and he brings it to the mother. 
He doesn't just go on his way. He takes time. He didn't have to do this. And I imagine him taking the son by the hand and walking over to the mother on the ground and them kneeling beside her and Jesus giving the son that's back to life to his mother who's restored, who's whole again. What an incredible experience. That's what we have in Christ. And so something I think about when I see this son come back to life is this. Like the son in the story, God brought us back to life and he brings us to the Father. Look what Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 5 says. Paul's writing to the church and he says, look, as for you, there was a time in your life when you were dead in your transgressions and sins. You were like this young man laying on a coffin. And look what he says, in which you used to live and you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work and the sons who are disobedient. This is how you used to live. And you were a dead man walking. Verse 3, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature receiving wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who was rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And here Jesus walks up to this young man as an act of grace, an undeserved, unmerited gift. And by the way, the son has how much faith? Zero, okay? You don't need faith in order to receive healing uh, from God at this point. And so there are a lot of people who have a healing ministry, and they say, well, the reason why you weren't saved or the reason why you weren't healed is because you didn't have enough faith. And I'm like, how much faith did the dead guy have, right? And Jesus still brought him back to life. So we can't get confused that, that God's not healing you because you don't have enough faith, okay? This was an act of God on his terms for the glory of the news of Jesus, that's why it was. And so if God hasn't healed you, there may be another reason. Maybe God's working out his glory in your life. Or maybe God's working out his will and, and his providence to bring other people to the gospel because they see how you deal with your suffering. But regardless of that, it's simply this. God saved us while we were completely dead as an act of his grace. And we are a church that believes we are saved by grace through faith with a repentant heart at the time of baptism that we hold fast to the idea that it is fully and so much of God's grace, it is not of ourselves. The only thing that we can do is accept it on his terms. And so hopefully you've been able to identify with some people in the story, the woman whose heart is shattered, the son who is dead and brought, to, brought back to life, the Jesus who is bringing a ministry of healing to the people around him. But then there's finally another character in the story. What happened once Jesus did this? What happened once the compassion and the love of God was made known? Look what it says in verse 16. They were filled with awe, the people, and they began to praise God. It literally means they gave glory to God. I would hope that when we have moments in our life where God has brought healing or hope or success, that we would give him the glory and we would not say, this is something that I've done or it's something of me, but this is something of God. Look what it goes on to say in verse 16. Look what they said about Jesus. A great prophet is among us. And I like to think this was exactly the location, Nain, where Elisha in the Old Testament raised a, a, a dead son back to life. I would like to think that they're thinking of Elijah in this moment. Elijah, guess, who Eli, guess what Elijah did? Elijah raised a dead son of a widow back to life in 1 Kings chapter 17. And so when they see Jesus doing this, they're thinking, wow, there is a great prophet among us. This is the real deal. And Jesus is going to go on to show, I'm not just a great prophet, but I am God himself because I not only raise people back from the dead, but I raise myself back from the dead. And Jesus will show that later on for those of us who know the story. But here's the deal. What do people hear about you and say about you when you react to the word of God and his healing ministry in your life? When bad times come upon you, how do you respond? Do you give God the glory? When people look at you in your ministry, are they saying, wow, this person is different. They're, they're like us, but they're different. They must have God on their side. I think that's how we should be living our lives. And look at what verse 17 says. It says, this news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and around the country. And so like the crowds who left rejoicing, and we can see God's healing hand in their lives, and we can see God's healing hand in our lives, and we can share that hope with people. 
You see, Romans 12, 15, not only said mourn with those who mourn, but it also says rejoice with those who rejoice. And we are called to celebrate the work of God 